be safe was to bring my family to Canada. We stayed there for 20 years. After 20 years, after 9-11, we felt we were led by God, by the Spirit, to go back to the Philippines. As a Canadian citizen this time, but so Filipino in my culture, in my blood, and yet when I arrived in Mindanao, I felt disoriented because 20 years I was out of the Philippines, out of touch. And so my first year of learning was to learn, to listen, and not to continue the agenda of 20 years ago, you know, 1986 to 006. So do we leave or do we stay? Right now, I say we'll stay. Because during the first uh, time I was active against the Marcos senior presidency and dictatorial re regime, we are now faced again with his son, the son of the dictator voted in as our new president. And it's so easy for me to think of leaving the country. And if this nation want to go on and lead the you know, be the nation they want to be, when we lost the election last month and Lenny Robredo did not win and the son of the dictator, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. won, overwhelming. I said, so this is what my country wants. Why should I keep doing justice, peace, and reconciliation work in this country when they don't want it? So I wanted to leave in the first two days after election. And then Wendy told me, can you speak on this? It's so awkward. I don't want it. <laughs> now, after a few weeks, my wife and say, my wife and I said, we will stay. Why? We need to be immersed. We need to be with our people. I miss my two daughters and their families who live in Vancouver right now. My son and his family joined us in our ministry here. Our work is basically decolonizing peace building approaches here in the Philippines. And from as a follower of Jesus, we want to look at peace building, justice based peace building, and uh, conflict uh, transformation and reconciliation from a perspective of the process of decolonization and indigenization. And so that's where I'm at right now. I have no definite answers or definite principles to tell you, except that we believe we should stay and we will walk with the people it may not be secure, it may not be safe, but either we're crazy or we, the peace of Christ is really true. Or maybe caffeine have, helps too, because we sell coffee. <laughs> That's where I am right now. My hope is for the new generation to continue this vision of decolonizing, peace building, justice, ministries and reconciliation ministries and now my main focus is to train young people like tala tala it's your turn thank you ama mom for your cow to ulosan so that in our language that's good day to all of you and ama is um the tagalog language for father so um the question of staying or leaving it actually indicates um it indicates mobility it indicates um whether you're going away or you're coming home to a place you call home 
either by force or by choice. So I grew up in a homogeneous indigenous community. And so my elders always taught me in so many ways, verbal, nonverbal, through tradition, through storytelling. But I grew up that number one, I am not just an individual. Every time I introduce myself, actually every time someone asks my name in our place, it's never my name. What they are asking is, who is my family? Who is my tribe? So I never say my name is Tala. I always say, I'm the, 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 uh, I'm the daughter of, the granddaughter of, from the tribe of, and then I will say my name last if they ask me. And so I grew up with that sense. And every time our elders will tell us, as the, uh, the younger people, o og nang tapan ukali, or always hold on to the values. Because it's always, um, it was always ingrained in us that we would have to go away because we need to go to school. Because that's the only way we can engage with the bigger systems. We have to go through formal education. And unfortunately, during our generation, um, schools were not yet in our, in our tribe. We just had a sixth grade uh, school. So we have to go away. We have to go to the sixth grade. And my elders always tell us, Og nantapan ukali. Always hold your values. Always hold our values. And our values is actually three. And these three cannot be separated at all. The paniyaw, the nilin, and bait. And our elders tell us we should hold these three together, not in not single values, not single or uh, separate values. So paniyaw are the values that govern your relationship with the spiritual world. Nilin are the values that govern your relationship with yourself and with creation. And bain are values that govern your relationship uh, with with others. And so. We were required or we were we were we had that responsibility to hold that wherever we go. We are we actually they always tell us, not in this word, but basically the summary is we are both an embassy and a diplomat. That which, which means wherever we are, the pe our people can be safe with us, and wherever we are, we carry our people with us, right? Wherever. Which means when I go to a place. I carry my people with me and my identity is tied to a clan and to a tribe. That's my foundation. So when I go to a place, how do I honor my relationship or the relationship with the spiritual world in that place? How do I honor their being? How do I honor the creation? How do I honor, how do I honor that land, that whole of it where I go? And I can only honor it through listening. So that's why it's intensive listening. So through listening and intentional relationship building, that's how I can honor it. And and I and I have learned as I as I got older that I was only able to truly listen when I knew where my center was. When when I really appreciated the foundation that I had my the, my people my tribe and the values that they have taught me that's how i was able to listen to the to, to the people that i am engaging with without getting lost and so staying and living for me is not just a question of staying or living it's more of a question of how well have i listened how well have i related that the place have claimed me as their own and how can i know when the claim, when the place have claimed me as their own when i go away and the people that place, all of the place, it still tells me to come home to them. That whenever I go back, I still have a hope with them. That's when I know a place have claimed me. And I can only be claimed when I have truly listened and engaged with them. However, if that's how I engage with other people, that's how, that's how we also, in our tribe, that's also how we expect people to engage with us. If people come with a listening heart, a relational heart, oh, I'm telling you, you're the safest. <laughs> you will never go hungry. That's what the Leviticus said. The foreigner will never get abused. But if the foreigner starts thinking that they own us or they own the creation around us, that's when we will have to have a dialogue or maybe even more than a dialogue. <laughs> because 
we are also we are also um we have a uh, a deep appreciation or a deep connection to all the beings around us so that's all wendy wendy so here's wendy <laughs> So we wanted to give you a sense of one of the organizations that has already joined the Global Anabaptist Peace Network, giving you a sense of the staff that are part of it, uh, some of the things that they are thinking about, and to now give you a chance to interact with that. And we decided we'd like to ask you the same questions that we asked on June 28th, after people heard these two speakers and also Erica Little Wolf, which I guess on another occasion you'll need to listen to. So our, we had two kind of prompting questions and um, we're gonna ask, see if you have some just ideas that you would like to share in a moment. The first question that we asked people on June 28th was, is there anything that you heard that resonates with your own context that you would like to share with us to give you, give us a deeper understanding of who you are and the kind of place in which you do your peace work? And the second question we asked was, did you hear something that inspired you um, in a way that enhances your ideas about peace building? Was there something new? Or was there something challenging in what you heard? So into that space of those uh, two kinds of prompting set of questions, wanting to open up this space for conversation, our intention for this introduction to GAPN is to get to know you, for you to get to know our network a bit better. And for us, that means having time for conversation. So since Andres and I need to keep doing this shifting mic thing, since the mic is now open on my side, um, let me open to Zoom participants at this point. So anyone on Zoom, any of those questions uh, connect with you? And um, I will, as you're thinking, put those questions in the chat. Maybe I can start. Um, I yeah, thank you. I really appreciated the sharing from Mindanao. Um, and for me, the question of should I stay or I shouldn't. I need to talk into this microphone. Um, should I stay or should I go? Um, implied the question of first of all, like what are the forces kind of pushing me or pulling me to leave? um and is it possible to stay um and the other question was where would i go to and the necessity of safe places to go to um and places of hospitality where maybe it's not such a if there were many places of hospitality maybe it wouldn't be such an absolute leaving or going situation and could be more of a, I can go for now. <laughs> and knowing that it will not be such a hassle. Um, yeah, so we are thinking a lot here about um, hospitality as we are in a transit hub. Um, and also we have had to receive people now with um, Ukraine and also with other waves of refugees before. That's, those are my thoughts. Thanks, Benjamin. I uh, see another hand there, Elian. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for, for, uh, for the input, which was like just very inspiring for me. Um, so one thing that resonated a lot with me was this, um, this uh, also the, the sort of the, the, 
this con uh, or this this um, ex maybe explanation also of of, of uh, sort of a collective identity, which I resonate a lot with in just a way that um, I grew up with in in my family, um, which is very contrary to like the very individual identity that I'm like that I know for, from friends and, and uh, um, people around me in my context and sort of um, I, I, I thought about like this uh, during the presentation about like this question of, of should I stay or should I go um, in, in the video it was like mostly about like uh, the danger of, of leaving or staying or like finding uh, safe places or, or um yeah and f for me i th i find like it's it's much more like i'm i'm uh, doing research on on uh, on nonviolence uh, here in switzerland uh, well i i do the research in switzerland um and it's always this question um like sh should i do the research here should i go somewhere else where where like um uh, um like Peace research is, is more um, more more relevant, but at the same time, I find myself like being like in in everyday life. There's still so much violence around here. Like it's 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 it's. I mean, compared to to uh, to a war zone, it's quite uh, benign, uh, maybe uh, kinds of violence, but still there is so much violence in um, how people interact. And I think it's it's so important to still like change that also also here and um, yeah so that's sort of like where uh, where's the where's the place where where I yeah even even though like people would always ask me yeah well what what kind of peace work do you want to do in Switzerland because Switzerland is the safe so like yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> thanks Elian. Maybe I'll add, as some here are, are thinking about how they might respond, the, the speaker that we didn't show you, while well, there were several more, um, Erica Littlewolf, an Indigenous woman from the United States, she made a comment. She, she was living somewhere in the U.S., I'm not quite clear on that, but she made the statement, the land called me back home. And so she's now back uh, with her people in Montana. But uh, I thought of that statement just listening to you, Elian. You know, where where are we? Uh, uh, where's the best place for us to be with the kind of things we need to work on? And her comment just highlighted that the calling comes from many different levels or or entry points for her is very clear. The land called her back. And so she could not ignore that call. So sometimes it's from surprising and uh, maybe unusual uh, voices we need to listen to in terms of what guides where we're doing uh, our peace and justice work. Doug, I see your hand. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, yeah, just coming back to that theme again, and I was part of that initial discussion a week ago, uh, should we go or should, should we stay? Uh, this Saturday, it's in a couple of days, um, I am hosting a group from Tabor College who is currently on our campus here in Lithuania, and we, I will be taking them to the Rukla refugee camp, one of four refugee camps here in Lithuania. And this is a refugee camp, not of Ukrainians, because all the Ukrainians are welcomed into homes and places of residence in Lithuania with, with no problems. This is a refugee camp of people that came about a year ago from Belarus who had been trafficked from the Middle East and around the world and told that Belarus was an entry into the EU. Um, so they sold their life savings and uh, ended up in a refugee camp now in Lithuania because Belarus tossed all these people across the border, used as pawns in a political tit-tat uh, for sanctions against Belarus from the EU and NATO. 
Anyways, uh, these folks are in a very difficult place. They chose to go, and now they are stuck and caught in uh, a web of political brinksmanship. Uh, so we're going to introduce uh, these folks from Tabor College and from Wichita and Hillsborough, Kansas, uh, <laughs> to them on Saturday. And um, it'll be my, my second opportunity to be there. We lived in containers with these folks for five days back in May and worked with them in resiliency and trauma training and uh, peace building and leadership. But I guess my comment on this would be uh, they had agency to choose to go and now they have no agency. And they are at the at the whim of the political will of other powers. Um, and we are trying to raise our voices and as advocates for them. And as we work with them and are invited to work with them uh, from the Lithuanian ministry of uh, social, uh, social work ministry, um, we are hoping and praying that they would be treated by international humanitarian standards uh, and other EU standards and be granted asylum. We were just at a refugee conference in Vilnius about a, a week and a half ago where we listened to the debate between the welcome of Ukrainians all over Europe and the unwelcome of all the rest. Uh, who are in our midst, depending on which country they happen to land in. So I, our hearts were torn uh, with all of this, and they continue to be. And we are grateful for opportunities and little cracks in the door to be able to befriend and empower, co-power. Co and uh, hopefully we've heard some word from uh, in the news recently that the Lithuanian government is looking at allowing them to get out of which is basically a prison camp um, and grant them at least work permits and some accessibility for movement. Uh, so that's, that's our current situation apart from the Ukraine reality and of course threats to the Baltic by, by the uh, <clears throat> Russian, Russian government federation as well. Thanks for the sharing of that context, Doug. Anyone else on Zoom that hasn't uh, spoken yet that wants to give us a sense of things you're thinking about? I will uh, turn the mic over to you, Andres, and uh, we'll hear from those who would like to in this room. And then we're going to move to kind of general questions you can ask about uh, how the GAPN functions and Andres will lead us on that. Perfect. Thank you very much for also your comments. So here, there will be the space for people who are present, if you would like to add or to engage in the conversation to do so uh, right now. Safari, you wanna let us know a bit about your context? Thank you, everyone. In our context in Africa, there are many thousands and thousands of refugees who are living in a different way, different places, like in Malawi, Uganda, Mozambique, Congo. For us at MB, we are focusing on starting Peace Club in refugee camp. Why Peace Club or Peace Group? We believe if people can be trained, can be equipped in refugee camp, when they go back home, they can be ambassador 
to participate on peace. And uh, second, we have starting a new program of trauma healing because the level of people who are living in a refuge camp, the level of trauma is very, very high. And uh, we try to help them to do counseling, to do reconciliation. And uh, I hope when you have new generation who are peacemaker, who can grow with new spirits of love, peace, and reconciliation, I hope we'll have a good generation. And uh, in future, we need, we need to invest too much in young generation. Because if you deal with <laughs> the people who are maybe families in Africa, someone gonna have 10, 15 children, He's busy to look food for his 15 children and other things and to take him, to teach him. I hope it's take time to understand what you are doing and have time to do with him. But if you have new generation, young African who can be involved in peace building, will be the better Africa and uh, Africa will be peace continued. Thank you. This is what you can share. Thank you. Doc, are you are you raising your hand still, or is it up? Okay. <laughs> Not anymore. Oh, it was. Yeah. It was. Uh, it was. Run it was run. Uh, yeah. Um, maybe uh, let me let me make a couple of comments, if I may. Uh, okay, first, uh, Benny, you have uh, you are coming about the work. Sorry, coming I just wanted to uh, suddenly up about it. Okay, wait a second, wait a second, then, because we're putting the sound on, and then we'll we'll give you. Yeah. Now go on. Mm -hmm. Okay, this happened again. What I always do, and I just wanted to suddenly alert us that there is another workshop on similar themes uh, happening in a few hours about it's called the walled world um, and breaking down barriers of hostility. Uh, it's online. I didn't actually want to take center stage. I <laughs> please continue <laughs> with your uh, with your things. Yeah, people feel free to add interesting things in the chat for us. That's great. Thank you. Uh, maybe a couple, a couple of comments. I mean, things that were triggered, I think, in the conversation. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm just remembering some of the topics uh, that we discussed last time around. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the, what I will call, we had this in a, in a breakout room, the conversation about the stigmatization of people leaving a place, right? Like how can you stigmatize and how it becomes stigmatizing also the, um, some form of action towards people who leave or to decide to leave a place for to, to protect their lives, to protect the lives of, of, the, of their loved ones and and so on. And and I mean, I was reminded about the, some of these discussions that we have uh, in the country that I, that I was born in, which is Colombia, uh, when it comes to the internal displacement and discussions about the internal displacement and how that could, you know, be again seen some of these actions as uh, as uh, betrayals, you can say sometimes. But also how the, the question of hospitality and reception becomes a triggering point, right? Like usually internally displaced people in Colombia, so people who live in the countryside, mostly campesinos, campesinas, farmers, they are displaced by the by the violence in different forms, threats, actions of armed groups, pressure, economic, I mean, poverty, and so on, and they end end up basically covering the marginal spaces of of the big cities. Bogota is a good example, the capital of Colombia, right? So a lot of people come to the surroundings and they create this, what I would call the line of poverty and, and I mean, really uh, rough conditions in the outskirts of the city. Um, so there's a whole discussion about that kind of movement and and and, and the reception, hospitality uh, and so on. And I remember it was, a, it was a huge discussion even at the church level, at the Mennonite church level where I belonged. Um, ultimately to, to be able to be willing to be more receptive to um, 
let's say, to, to internally displaced communities and people. Um, and even then there were some, so I, I perceived some tensions between different forms of decision making when it came to, you know, do you, do you stay, do you go? Then do you stay in the country is the next level? Or do you, do you want or do you attempt to leave the country as a, as a politically, as a political refugee somehow? Um, and again, there will be all kinds of stigmatization. So I thought, I, I, I don't know, I was, I was thinking a lot about that. And we had on the first day, so 27 of June, Isaac Villegas, which is based in North Carolina, pastor in North Carolina, uh, with the Latino background uh, in terms of his parents. And I, I, he helped me quite a lot to, to create language for different moments and different options, I think. So if I recall, but you have to correct me, the ones who were there, um, I think he offered three different levels of um, sort of thinking about this, this, this topic. Yeah. So he first used the, 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 the text of Abraham, you know, the sending of Abraham as a moment we can actually think that going to a different place can be an act of blessing to others. You know, how it's not just about forced migration, it's not about forced displacement, but how you can be actually a call or be called to actually be a witness and to serve and to, to have a life or to witness in a different place. And then this idea of, of movement, I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting dimension that you, that you engage in that kind of motion. It could be actually a blessing for yourself, but also for others, for the, for the receiving community, if you will. So it doesn't have to be necessarily triggered by violence. Um, it doesn't have to be triggered by, by, by force conditions, so to speak, but it can also be um, actually inspired by your own journey and your own faith uh, and what your life is, is going. Um, so that was one of the elements. The other, of course, is when there are moments where the place where you are based, uh, let's say the conditions and the possibility to witness to, to God's peace is not really possible anymore. So to understand the moments, also the conditions are not given for your life, but also to, to create in a space for so, so much oppression and, and injustice that is really difficult at any point to conceive that there's a moment where you can lose that. And then the idea of leading and force force living it becomes kind of a kind of an option and then of course the idea of staying assuming that you have this particular connection with land and that 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 should not be uh disturbed and and you try to witness to that with with all kinds of of um yeah i don't know with with your life even and uh, that you really want to stay and you want to to remain in a place so to think about this 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 more these complexities right of you know leaving staying and and even the leaving part the arriving to a new place, I think would really help me to think about how you can be um, a witness in a different place um, and how you can you can serve it in a different place. So I, I don't know, it, it really triggered my mind or it really provoked some thoughts about that, especially based on the on this, as I said, this Colombian experience. Betty. Did, did, um, wait, wait I... a second, wait a second, sorry, sorry. Sorry, wait a minute. <laughs> We're using two computers, so we have to always coordinate with when the, the, the sound, sorry, sorry about that. Okay. Um, did Isaac have You're scriptural? On now. Yeah. Did Did Isaac have scriptural Ugh. like people for I the other know. ones? Okay. Did, so you said Abram and Sarah for the first. Did I Did I not catch the other ones? Was there a scriptural like person or instance for the other ones? I, I'd be curious about that. Okay. Let me try. Let me try. Uh, let me try to answer that. No, I don't remember. They, he he used frequently references, biblical references. I don't recall the, the the particular words, but we can because we don't have our notes actually with us right now. But we can double check that, uh, and we can we can be in contact about that. But I thought. At least the option to provide the language, right? I mean, I have been more, I mean, I've been closely with or closely attached to this language of pilgrimage because of the World Council of Churches. Um, and that's yet another language, another metaphor to describe and to think about movement and motion, uh, which yet involves kind of other complexities, I would say. Um, and also, which has a colonial uh, power or has, or has a colonial connotation, right? I mean, many, many, many times missionaries uh, from the global north were introduced as. as um, as pilgrims of the way, so to speak, and, and leading actually to displacement and, and appropriation of, of uh, First Nations and, and indigenous lands, and then um, and, and then converting people. So, so it's it's also has some complexities. Um, 
I think my point was uh, to think Andre? about how, how there are different models and different kind of metaphors to, to, to think about these nuances that we need and, and that lead us or that enable us to overcome the, the easy stigmatization and, and you know, the, the immediate reaction to someone who decides to stay or to go or to have a transition. Um, I mean, one, one more example I still remember, actually, we did that with CPT once, visiting one community in Colombia, and they described to us how they had developed with three neighboring communities a whole system of internal migration or migration between villages whenever an armed group will come to the region. So an armed group would show up one day in the village, and then that, that community would move for a month, a period of four weeks or something. They would be hosted by the next village, so to speak, and then they created this kind of system that they that enable them eventually to actually come back. So the idea of returning, for example, is, is then uh, pops up. You know, how do you return then eventually to the land uh, from where so from at, at, at one point you had to leave? Um, so it's 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 just to to think about those those complexities. Andrew, you want to make a comment? Yeah. I think one of the other things that also uh, pops into my mind in listening to some of these reflections and also in listening to Tala. Um, and the reflections that Tala offered. Um, I mean, one of the things that she mentioned, for example, was that when she, she says that she doesn't live or that we are not individuals, right? But that we are inter intricately connected to communities and families and tribes and what have you, right? And I think that that is one of those pieces when it comes, when, when oftentimes I think that when we ask the question, shall we stay or shall I go? Oftentimes we interpret that in a in an individualized way, right? Shall I stay or shall I go? And there's a lot of then there's a lot of guilt, there's a lot of trauma that what that 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 comes along with that personal decision as to whether or not I should go. But I think that there's a lot of very there's a lot of uh, of, of richness and possibility when we recognize our interconnectedness as a community. Because then it's, even if I leave, I know that there is a community that stays and continues the work that needs to be done. Even when, for example, it might be particularly, it's too difficult or too dangerous or, um, or whatnot for me or my particular family or what have you, right? And so de-individualizing this question, I think, is of particular significance. And I'm, I think of the context that we're in, you know, in this week, right, where we're looking at the global church and who we are as the global church, there may be times when people have to leave or when they choose to leave. But we, as a global community, we also recognize the interconnectedness of the people who also continue to stay and that our work may continue, right? So I think there's a real richness that I personally am tempted to really lean into in what Tala was talking about in just in, 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 in kind of moving away from that individualism, which I think is kind of inherent or, or, or yeah, inherent within that question, right? Just to say that probably that means that the question will change from shall I stay to shall I go to shall we stay, shall we go, <laughs> right? As a, in this more communal sense or, or to think more about in, in that kind of key. Um, I am looking that my battery is almost out. And if we adjust that, yeah, I hope we will. Okay, so all right. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, let's have just, I mean, we're, we're trying to be mindful of time. Um, and, or which of us should stay and which should go? That's also a good yeah. question. Thank you. Yeah, Benny, it's, it's, a, it's also a good, a good yeah. way of phrasing the, the question. Uh, and who can receive the, the question of hosting and reception uh, of communities? I think that's, that's also an important one. Um, so as yeah, as we can see, it's um, yeah, it's a whole process of discernment. It seems uh, I think following what what Wendy is writing right now. Um, let me share with you. Uh, okay, first of all, is there are there any final questions or any burning thoughts that you would like to share before we move to the last part of this workshop? I don't want to leave this with the, the feel that someone had really wanted to say a last word and uh, about this topic for the for the time being we know this conversation continues but just for the time being if there's some last burning uh, comment or question from your side
Well, if there's not uh, one, then let me make this transition. Let me share one more time screen with you. And let me, uh, let's say, make a transition from now, from this time with the poem. Um, I have been more and more connected to the work of Dorothy Seller, German theologian, uh, but especially or significantly with her uh, poetry in recent times. Um, I mentioned in a, in a, I mean, a few uh, days ago that we had the opportunity in a class in, in Amsterdam a few, I think at the beginning of September or in September last year, uh, to have a session on spirituality and peace building. And we decided to read different poems uh, from Dorothy Seller and decide which kind of poems you were particularly attached or connected to. And I think this particular poem that I will want to share with you was the one that received a lot of support and most of appreciation for the people, for the students who were present. So I will read that. The original version is, is what you can see in white in this, um, in this text. I have added uh, the red parts so it can be read also in a more inclusive terminology and language, if you will. So let me read that uh, for you. She, he needs you. That's all there is to it. Without, without you, she, he is left hanging. Goes up in Dachau smoke. Is sugar and spice in the baker's hands. Gets revalued in the next stock market crash. She, he is consumed and blown away. Used up without you. Help him. Her, that's what faith is. She, he can bring it about. He's her kingdom. Couldn't then, couldn't later, couldn't now. Not at any rate without you. And that is his, her irresistible appeal. Totally so Sometimes when our theological concepts or peace building categories do not help, sometimes I think poetry and art, the arts can help us, uh, even a language, I think sometimes, or communicate more than given language, communicate some of these uh, other levels of our faith and our spirituality of peace building that, that we and many times need. Now, for this last segment, we wanted to quickly just point out uh, some elements about the Global and About This Peace Network, starting for the website. If you're interested in knowing more about the Global and About This Peace Network, you know, for instance, how to join, um, how to access more information or where to read stories that the network is, is, uh, will make available, then you can always go. This is the main uh, website of MWC, Mineral Conference. You can always go to what we do. And there you will always find networks. So there are all the networks that are affiliated with Mennonite World Conference. And here you find the Global and Baptist Peace Network. So here you can find more information about the network. Um, that includes, for, for instance, terms of reference, how to become members, who can be members, and can apply for membership, and what the process is like. If you're interested to know more about these things, we invite you to visit the website. I will uh, copy the link if you want to follow up on that. Uh, and we are very much open to any question uh, that can come up now. But also, if you want to follow up later uh, with me or with Wendy via email, you can always find us. My email is always available here at the website. So you can always reach out to me. And I will be happy to uh, assist in the process of addressing some of the questions, comments that you might have regarding the Global and Baptist Peace Network. Uh, now, the other part, in addition to this uh, a small, um, let's say, uh, promotion of, of the website, which we want, of course, to encourage and then to uh, hope that you might visit, is to say that we're hoping to, to meet, to meet next, next year for the first time physically. Our hope is to do that in the third Global Mennonite Peace Building Conference and Festival. Now we'll turn it to, to Andrew, if that is okay. Um, and he will let you know a bit more about the conference and just, just for you to keep that in mind, your agendas, and maybe that might be of interest for you. So I want to turn to you for that. Thank you very much, Andres. Um, yeah, as, as Andres mentioned, um, we are excited to have and host the third Global Mennonite Peacebuilding Conference and Festival. 
That'll take place from June 16th to the 18th of 2023. And it'll take place at Eastern Mennonite University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Uh, so please put that into your calendar. Um, make plans or figure out how to get there because we would love to see you there. Um, we will also have, um, I think, a GAPN uh, gathering. This will be kind of part of the GAPN gathering, um, but it would be good to, uh, for people who are part, officially part of the GAPN to be able to uh, meet there as well. Um, the, we will be sending out a save the date kind of flyer um, that'll, that'll go out to our whole mailing list uh, with regards to the Global Anabaptist Peace Network. Um, and you can also expect a, um, a call for papers, art installations, um, um, workshops, et cetera, um, in early September. We're hoping to send out the call for papers uh, and the invitations for participation in early September as we begin to craft the program. So looking forward to that time next year. I think it'll be very good and rich. Thank you. So please keep that in mind. Um, that would be always important. Thanks, Wendy, for writing. So you can find the chat reminders of dates uh, and where to find more information. And just to keep these thoughts in mind as, as we move on to the last to this last part. Uh, so keep it in mind. We really hope that that would be a space for encounter. So far, the first two uh, conferences and festivals have been really great spaces to meet, to network. Uh, to learn and to be challenged in peace building witness in different forms uh, from artistic uh, performances and 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 expressions all the way to you know practitioners uh work of churches and academic scholar work and so on it's, it's a beautiful combination i must say showing the diversity of peace witness um, which i think inspires quite a lot so so we hope that you can join and also that you can use that opportunity to meet with us one more time with the Global Anabaptist Peace Network as we plan to meet in that time. Other questions or things you would like to know um, that we haven't mentioned? Uh, as I said, we, um, we're op always open to, to keep the conversation going uh, via Zoom. Eileen, give, um, give, 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 give us a second, sorry. Yes, a second. Mm -hmm. To make sure that we can hear you. Okay, we're gonna hear you. Mm -hmm. That never goes the first time. Hmm. Eliane. Yeah, so um, uh, as I understood it, the, the uh, BIM sort of a member of, of uh, uh, JPN um, is, is uh, um, for, for uh, organizations, right? So my question would be like, um, how can individuals connect? Um, especially like from uh, with this question of um, as a researcher also is there like is the GAPN a good place to to um, come ask questions uh, or uh, also like to connect um, amongst uh, uh, um, uh, um, Anabaptist uh, peace researchers? Thank you Ilian for that question. Um, as we started organizing the GAPN, we asked that question of, should we be more than uh, organizations? And what we've talked about is that in phase one, to just get going, that we would be in contact with global, you know, Anabaptist Mennonite peace organizations as a way to bring some larger set of uh, resources and questions into the mix and that we would then move to a second phase where we would invite uh, people like yourselves, the way you're describing yourself, um, individual practitioners. And so when we, in the early part of this coming year, start conversations with our current members and hopefully some of you here who represent uh, Anabaptist Mennonite organizations might consider us as a, as a place to do some of your peace work. This will be one of our questions that when do we feel a little bit kind of solid with some direction in which to engage uh, some of these individual uh, passions and interests. So for you to write an email to Andres and say, hey, let me know when you're starting that conversation because I'm interested in that. So we are heading that direction. 
and would certainly then want to be in contact with you. Is there anyone else on Zoom that has a question since we've got this side of the mic open right now? And so Andres put his email address there. There's someone in this room that has a question and then I'll shift the microphone back. My question is the local church can. Yep, just a sec. I will mute my end. No, no, I just to repeat the question which someone asked me. He's a Dr. Joshua. He asked me. A local church who are working on peace can apply to become member for Mennonite Peace Network. Is possible as a local church? Um, let me try to answer that. We have had. It's interesting how this uh, different questions have have come to us. Uh, so far, we have uh, joined the first, the first um, actually uh, church in in the network as a member, actually from Malawi. Okay. The M is from Malawi. Um, yeah. In principle, which is actually your church, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just to say that, <laughs> to emphasize that part. Um, but to, this is this is an interesting opportunity. How and to what extent some congregations, peace ministries within churches, perceive that they can be actually you know bodies that can join the GAPN. Uh, I think in principle, those are those are spaces that we also want um, to invite to join. Um, and I think whenever there will be some questions or process of discernment, we want to discern these questions with you. Uh, so for, for instance, if we get uh, applications for a, for a local congregation, in principle, we will always consider these this applications. And if there are some, I mean, questions as to, you know, pertaining, is it a peace ministry? Is it you know a particular group within the church? Is it the church as a whole? So we can engage a bit on the servant about what would be the best way of connecting with the GAPN in those particular cases. But I, but in principle, I would say that they are very welcomed. Uh, local congregations that are, that are you know thinking in addition to many things they do and witness to uh, that peace work and peace witness is one of their important uh, characteristics and, and 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 part of the work and ministry uh, to to the, to consider that also as an option. Uh, to join the EAPN, um, if 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 you want. Um, thanks for the question. Also, it's it's a very good question because it's it's it has come up at some point. And it helps us also to always think have that in mind as an alternative. So I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I am trying to be mindful of the time, and I propose that we close one more time with a prayer. This time is a very short. This is almost a sending uh, blessing at the end. Oh, sorry, Wendy. Uh, Which one? Are there themes? All right. Thank you. Thank you. So I think Wendy mentioned at the beginning of this of this space um, that we want that we're thinking and discerning as global and about this peace network as a result of our meeting last time around uh, about the possibility of defining a team for next year at least. So we want to focus on a team and we want to you know direct most of our attention in terms of our sessions. Uh, probably organize a few a few webinars or, or conversations online around this topic. If there are any suggestions or recommendations that you might have about, you know, this is a pressing topic or this is a team that we find uh, potential or we might seem or we think that might be very important to this cause for such a network and for the organizations and churches that are connected to it. Uh, we will very much appreciate those suggestions and recommendations. So you can send uh, those to us to either Wendy's email that you have now in the chat as well, or to my email. So are these are there teams, issues, actions that you would like to see the GAP and the Global and Baptist Peace Network work on? Uh, that would be the question. And if you have them in mind, of course, uh, as a good friend of mine would say, uh, you are very, very clever five minutes too later, you know? five minutes after something has happened. I, and I always like that expression. So if something comes to you five minutes later, so to speak, as my good friend would say, then please let us know. I think it's a good, it's a good way to describe it. Now let us close, uh, if that is, thanks for the reminder, Wendy. 
Um, let us close in a time of, of, of uh, common blessing, I would propose. And I will invite you just to open your mic. There will be probably some a bit of chaos here involved, uh, but it's part of, of this of this time of, of these hybrid modes. Uh, so let's read this this blessing together, if 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 you are willing to. God, God please, please go before us, us to lead. Walk, walk, walk beside us, beside us, us to be friends. To be friends. We are the above us protect. to protect. Stay behind us, stay behind us to direct, to direct. To direct. beneath us, to, us, us, to, us to, support. to support. Abide us with us to love. To love. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for your presence here. It, it really means a lot. Uh, and we look forward to connecting in multiple ways and different ways in the future with each one of you. Thank you so much and peace be with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Peace be with you. Thank you. Bye-bye.